say welcome. It's going to be a great day as we're in week two of a series called I Am. If you missed last week's message, we encourage you to find it on YouTube at the Avenue Church's page or online at theavenuechurch.com. Incredible me a message from our pastor, David. Today is going to be an incredible day as we lean into week two of what it means uh, to be what Christ says we are and not what the world, what culture, what media says we are. And so we're excited that you're here. We want to empower you today to take your next step towards Christ, whatever that is.
is. Maybe that's uh, coming back next week. Maybe that's bringing somebody with you. Uh, next week, we have two great opportunities to take your next step towards Christ. Saturday morning, we are going to be hosting an event here in Waxahachie and in Ennis to pack uh, 8,000 backpacks for children in Afghanistan and Swaziland. We'd love for you to participate in serving with your whole family and with your church family, making a significant impact in the lives of children around the world. Uh, that's next Saturday morning. It's not too late to sign up. There's about 250 people signed up to serve here on Waxahachie's campus, about 150 in Ennis. Find a place to to plug in to serve next week and that's for your whole family we'd love to see you here next saturday also next weekend uh, we're going to be celebrating baptisms after every service baptism is a symbol it's a public symbol uh, in front of your church family that you belong to jesus that you believe what god says about you that you are redeemed that you are made new that your old life has been buried in the water and that as you raise up, you walk a new life with Christ uh, in the center of it. And so next week we are celebrating baptisms. For some of you in the room, your next step is to be baptized, to go public with your faith. You know that God has transformed your heart and your mind. He's working on you. He's, you're in process of becoming more like Christ and you need to make that public in front of your friends, in front of your family, in front of your church. And so we invite you next week uh, to come serve with us, to be baptized if that's your next step, wherever you are in your, your walk with Christ. We want to walk with you. And so today as we uh, sing a few more songs, as we listen to a message from our pastor, we invite you just to turn your attention to God, to give him um, all your thoughts right now, to get rid of all the distractions and just be focused on what God um, has for your life and what he says about your life. We are so glad you are here with us. Let's continue to sing. We're going to teach you a new song today. And before we do that, um, if you know me, you know that I love to brag about myself. Is this, is this correct? Is this right? Yes. Um, there's one thing that I just want to tie into this song, and it's, uh, you know, years ago, I, I will say, I do have a green thumb, okay? And there's something that I did, um, and I will say this too, I, I got Yard of the Month, okay? I'll say it th three times, Yard of the Month, all right? Yeah, thank you, thank you. There's a secret to it, it's not just my secret, but it's something that we call, uh, in the biz, we call it, deadheading and it's when you take something that that used to be beautiful that used to be alive used to be awake and, you know and it, and it died for whatever reason it might have had enough water it might have been in the, in the sun enough you might have followed all the rules but it, it just died it just it, it just doesn't exist anymore and I think that's what uh, God does to us all of us um, each day there's things about our lives that uh, we wish would change there's things about our lives that we look at we see uh, and they're dead gone, you know, what used to have life, what used to bring us a joy, it doesn't anymore, uh, but what God's doing is he's taking away those things and pruning them so that something more beautiful, something more uh, lasting, something more uh, life-giving will come to us, and, and that's a, just a song that we're going to do now, uh, I'm going to teach it to you, hope it speaks to you, and it's called Springtime. Oh, man. 
Thank you for singing with us. Go ahead and be seated. saint fans. I'm talking about actual saints. Now, if you weren't here last week, that's uncomfortable. You'd much rather me say, how are my sinners this morning? And we'd have got a lot more involved in that. All the sinners would be, yeah, yeah, we're here, we're here. We know you're sinners. But here's the great news, and we talked about this last week. Because you're in Christ, those of you who have followed Jesus, you're no longer just a sinner. You're actually a saint. You identify as a saint. And so that's what we're talking about going through the book of Ephesians. We're trying to understand our identity in Christ. And so those two words are going to be very important in Christ. Paul wrote 13 letters that we call the New Testament in the New Testament books. And in those 13 letters, he used the words in Christ 164 times. He wants you to understand that it's not about you. Living the Christian life has nothing to do with you working harder to live the Christian life. It has everything to do with you allowing Christ to live in you and through you. And so that's what we want to talk about this morning as we follow along in Ephesians and want you to see what it means. Now, let me describe, let me uh, kind of define what in Christ means. In Christ is, is not just believing in the person of Christ. It's not just believing he walked on the earth. Not just believing that he existed. 
There's more than that to be in Christ. It, it's actually being a follower. It's not just being a Christian, consider yourself a Christian. It, it's actually stepping across the line of faith and coming to the point in your life that you said, forgive me for my sins. I believe that you are God, that you have raised your son from the dead. And I believe that, and I want to live my life based on that belief. That's what faith is. And so when that happens, you become in Christ. So with your identity... It helps you understand how to act. Our identity shapes what we do. It decides, we decide what to do. So if you are in Christ today, the Bible says you're blessed. You are blessed. Now, let me explain blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? Because it's hard for you to understand what being blessed is. It's hard to understand because we live in the United States of America. We believe in a work ethic. We believe that you work, and when you work for something, you get it. Or we believe in a debt. If we get something, we owe something. Nobody gives us anything for free. We owe something. We have to owe it back. That's why blessing is so difficult because God wants to bless you and you can't work for it and you don't owe him anything in return. It's just from him as a gift. He blesses us. You see, we want to manipulate God. We kind of want to go, okay, God, I'm going to do this for you, so now I want you to do this for me. Or if God gives us something, we think we owe him something back. We're trying to manipulate him into God. If I, if I do this, then you'll do this. And God says, you know what? That's, that's not the way it is. You don't have to manipulate God. Here's the good news. God's good. You don't have to manipulate him to bless you. He just wants to bless you. You don't have to manipulate him to be good to you. He just wants to be good to you. It's exciting to see what God wants to do. It's not if I suffer, then God will bless me. Or if I give, God will bless me. If I have my quiet time every morning, God will bless me. Or what can I do to make him good? It's not that. He's already good. And if you're in Christ, you're blessed. Now, in the book of Ephesians, I'm about to read one sentence. Now, those of you who need to understand in Greek... Sentences are a little different. In fact, I would rather write in Greek because I was known for run-on sentences when I wrote papers. My professors would always criticize me and write back, run-on sentence. I'm like, dude, I'm just trying to get the point across. Punctuation is not that important. And so Paul, I agree with Paul. Paul has one sentence in the Greek text, 202 words long. Every English teacher just passed out. Now, they put punctuation in it for us, but Paul did not because it's one thought. He wants you to know that you're a saint. And because of your identity in Christ, you are blessed. And so this one long sentence is going to describe the blessings God has given you. So I want you to look in Ephesians 1, and it's chapter, it's chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. And these words are so important. It is Paul trying to explain our identity. He says, praise be to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ which you heard, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Whew, that's a long sentence. That is a long, that's even a long run-on sentence for me. 
I want to break this down, though, and I want you to see what God says in this. I want you to see, first and foremost, you are blessed because of Christ. It is not dependent on what you do. It is a position that you hold because Christ is in you. And so I want you to see you've been given every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. And so Paul starts naming some of those. And I want you to see the first thing he says you're blessed with is you are blessed with holiness. It says you're holy and blameless in his sight. This isn't our holiness. This is Jesus' holiness. He lived a perfect life, and he traded that life for yours, so he put you in a position of holiness, and so you don't have to live a perfect life because he already did it. Now, think about that for a minute, how exciting that is. God says you're holy. That's your identity. You're holy. If you identify with being holy, you act that way. If you identify with being a sinner... Guess what? When faced with a sin, you do what? Well, if you identify as a sinner, you sin. But you see, if you followed Christ and you're in Christ, when a sin comes along, you don't have to identify as a sinner. You're in Jesus' place. You accept his holiness, and so you identify as a saint and say, I am blessed, I am holy in his sight. And I can say no. I can say no. I'm holy and blameless in his sight because he made you holy. Now listen, if you've been made holy, you should act holy. If you've been made holy, your identity in Jesus changes your activity, it changes your decision, it changes the way you live your life. All of us, our identity shapes us. If you say my identity and you identify as a teenager, what do teenagers do? They rebel. I mean, teenagers rebel. So if you identify as a teenager, you rebel. If you identify as a college student, you do what? You party. Stay drunk. Go, to, go out. That's what you identify with. If you're a single person, you identify with hooking up and living together. That's what single people do. And so when you identify, you begin to live like that. I remember all of my kids searching for identity and trying to see what group they're going to connect with. And my oldest son was the funnest to watch do this because about ninth grade, once again, our family, we don't grow up very big, and we don't grow up till very late. I mean, it's like, you know, really, I'm still waiting. And so <laughs> with that, in ninth grade, he's on the soccer team, and he's about four foot nine, weighs about 80 pounds. But his identity was found in the fact that he wore a headband every game, a headband, stupidest looking thing in the entire world. And he was fast, and he was good at soccer. And so he's out there, and all the people in the stands started calling him Headband Boy. Aww. Look at Headband Boy. And mom, his mom and I begged him, please take that headband off. please." Take. But he loved it. He was Headband Boy, and he owned it. He owned it. So he wore that headband. And then when he's in 10th grade, I, I bought him a big old truck. Because, you know, when you're short, you want the bigger truck. And so we got the biggest truck, a big old Dodge, and it was lifted and had the big wheels on it and everything. And he decided that he was going to be country. I mean, girl walks at you. I mean, that's pretty obvious. That's easy, easy fix. So he's going to be country. And so he's listening to country music, and he's wanting to go hunting, and he's wearing boots, and he's a country boy until he goes to college. And then when he goes to college, he decides he's creative, which that was a long shot in our family. Remember, he came back from art class, and he had drawn a picture of one of my grandchildren. It was great. We're like, how did you do that? Did you trace that? Because we ain't got no talent. How'd you do that? And it was amazing. And he grew his hair out, started looking like Jesus. You know, and so everywhere, he was all over the map with his identity. I want you to know, when you identify with a, a group, you start acting like that. So I want you to hear, if you are in Christ, you need to identify with being holy. That way, when you're a teenager, you identify with being a holy teenager, and you make different decisions. You identify with being a holy college person, and so you don't do the things that other college kids are doing. You identify as a single Christian, a follower of Christ, and you don't do the things other singles are doing because you're holy. That's where your identity finds it. Listen, and hear me. The holiness is not in you. You're not holy because you're a good person. You're not holy because you're special. You're not holy because you're better than the people around you. You're holy for one reason only. You've traded places with Jesus. That's it. You've traded places 
with Jesus. You are blessed. It changes what you do. You're blessed by being chosen. I want you to hear this. He says, he predestined us for adoption to sonship and daughtership through Jesus Christ. Now, we see that word predestined, and if you're a church person, you just start going out of your mind. The word predestined is a big church word that church people love to fight about. Uh, You don't choose God. God chose you. You know, God chose before the beginning of the world. He picked you. And then that leads to the question, well, then why didn't he choose this person? And that's not fair that he chose me, but he didn't choose them. There's nothing in me that accepts. And so we get all excited, and we think God's up there playing a game of duck, duck, damned. You know? (laughs) He's up there, and he's deciding, you know, okay, duck, duck, damned. You're going to hell. That's not it. And so instead of trying to argue about being predestined, let's do this. Let's celebrate the fact that you're chosen. If you're in this room, if you're in the Ennis campus, if you're on the porch, if you're online, if you felt drawn to God at any time in your life, guess what? You're chosen. You don't have to think about it. God has chosen you. God is wooing you. God is pulling you. And that means wherever you are in this world, God can save you. Whatever you've done wrong in this world, God can save you. Whatever you haven't done in this world, God can save you. It doesn't matter how religious you are. It doesn't matter how rebellious you are. It doesn't matter how ridiculous you are. God can save you. And so if you felt the draw from God, you're predestined. You've been adopted. You've been brought in. That is good news. God loves you. He picks you. And he found you. He chose you to be a son Or a daughter, he adopted you. You see, God is not a force out there. He is a father. And that's exciting. Now, some of you don't understand adoption. And so I can explain it because I adopted a son at 18 months old. At 18 months old, a young man came into my home. I chose him. And he became my son at that point. No different than any of the natural born children. My love for him is exactly the same as my natural born children. I have given him my name and an identity as my child, and nothing can take that away. He belongs to me, and I understand that love. And then recently, I shared with you, I found out that my father was not my biological father. I have no blood relationship with that man that is my dad. But you know what? He took me in. He raised me as his own. I bear his name and his identity because he adopted me and I am his. So when I think about God, oh my gosh. I understand from adopting and being adopted. I understand that my father, my God loves me as his own. Period. No exceptions. That's good news. That's exciting. That is a blessing. We know our Heavenly Father loves us and has placed on us His identity. So guess what? You're blessed. You're blessed. You don't have to do anything to be blessed. You are already blessed. He goes on and says, you're also blessed by being redeemed. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. Now I want you to understand that word redemption because in the, in the Bible times, they understood slavery. Slavery was a big deal. There are a lot, a lot of slavery in this time. And so they talk about being redeemed, which means you had to be bought. You were enslaved. Someone was mastering over you. They controlled you. And you could be set free by being bought and released. In our culture, the best way to look at it is addiction. You can be redeemed from your addictions. You can be redeemed from the things that are mastering you, the things that are held over you, the things that have you in bondage. He says, I can release you. I have released you from all of that. I've paid for it. You don't have to be enslaved by your addiction anymore. Whatever it is, you don't have to be enslaved by it because I want to set you free. Redemption is an incredible thing all the way through the Word of God. It starts way back in the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, things become redeemed, bought back with a price. In fact, in the book of Exodus, there's a beautiful story. The Jewish people call it the Passover. The last plague on the Egyptian empire was that the firstborn of everything was to be killed. The angel of death was going to come through the land, and the firstborn was going to die. 
But he told the people that were followers, the people that were in God, he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take a lamb, and I want you to shed that blood, and I want you to put it on the doorpost of your home. And when the angel of death comes over, he knows that you've been redeemed. He's going to pass by you. You've been redeemed by that blood of that lamb. Beautiful foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. In fact, John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus come down to begin his ministry, he pointed at Jesus and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. John the Baptist knew that Jesus was going to lay down his life. And if you would put that blood on the doorpost of your heart, the angel of death was going to pass over you. You were going to be redeemed. You were going to be bought by his blood into a new identity. He says, that's the forgiveness of sins. We've been forgiven of our sins. What happens when you sin? We're all going to still sin, but there's something that happens after that. You can deny it, pretend it didn't happen. You can blame somebody else. We're good at that. We can diminish it and act like it's just not really a big deal. We can hide it and hope we don't get caught. We can punish ourselves and think we need to suffer because of it. Or we can just be forgiven. He says here, you're blessed. It's kind of amazing to us to think that we can sin and go to God. And God says, it's gone. I forgive it. Well, God, don't I need to? No, you don't need to do anything. Jesus did all of it. Live in it. Don't walk out of here a sinner. Walk out of here a forgiven, redeemed saint of God. Understand who you are in him. Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them as they were putting him to death. Father, forgive them. The forgiveness of God is overwhelming. It's incredible. And every one of you in this room have been predestined to receive it. Everyone listening online has been predestined to receive it. Everyone on the porch, in the cafe, and in us has been predestined. You've been chosen by God. Isn't that exciting to be in Christ, a new identity? He says, with that, you've been sealed. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. What he says is he's made a deposit for your future. You're not all you need to be yet. In Philippians, he says, he that began a good work in you will complete it. But he started that work by placing the Holy Spirit in your life. And when you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you get to live this holy life with his help. You are not living for Christ. You're allowing Christ to live through you. Now, does it take some effort on your part? It does. But it's wholly inspired effort. It's wholly empowered effort. He works through you to live through you. He empowers you. It is God's living his life for you. It's living his, God's living his life in you. And God's living his life through you by the power of that deposit. You're just beginning to be who God has called you to be. And when you understand your identity... You act differently. Why does God do this? Why does God do this? And I want to do some teaching here about theology. See, because we're blessed for his glory. And that's hard for us to understand. He blesses us not because of us, but because of him. And, and the best way I can put this, the you know, easiest way I can put it, is there's cat theology and dog theology. Okay, and let me explain that. If you've been around the avenue long, you know how I feel about cats. They are evil. It's the only creation that God lets Satan have. He just said, you can have it. They're below snakes. I mean, cats are... Now, please don't email me about your great cat. There's no such thing. I don't want to hear it. I've had people leave the church because I hate cats. Oh, well. I'm so sorry. I hate cats. I love dogs. Dogs are cool. You know, my dog, I come home. He is so excited to see me. It's incredible. It jumps up. and He's so happy to see me every time. It's annoying he's so happy to see me. I mean, I can't get my wife to do anything near that. But dogs are awesome. And so a dog just loves its master, right? I mean, a dog has a master. A dog just does anything for his master's attention. A cat has a staff. You are the slave to the cat. 
the cat is the master. I mean, come here, kitty, kitty. And it just looks at you. I, that does not know. I'm feeding you. I don't even let my kids do that. So you understand. The cat theology is God loves me. God chose me. God's blessing me. God's doing all this for me. God has eternity for me. God has a new nature for me. God has an eternal home for me. I must be amazing. Look how valuable I am to God. Look how important I am. That's cat theology. And you hear that sometimes. But see, we need to have dog theology. And dog theology is look at all God has done. Look at what God promises to do. I live for the praise of his grace. I thank God for all the things he does so that people can see him as glorious. God does all of this that I might tell everyone how glorious he is, how loving he is, how generous he is, how compassionate he is, how merciful he is, how long-suffering he is. I have an incredible master I want you to meet. That's dog theology. We need to be dogs, not cats. Because God is blessing us not because of what we've done. But because he is incredible. That's why when you see someone outside the church world, we should have nothing but compassion. Because except by the grace of God, that's us. We did nothing. We're not better than them. See, people outside the church think that we're judging them and we think we're better than them. That is a cat theology because we are not here because we are valuable. We are here because he is gracious. We are here because he is merciful. We are all, without God, nothing. But with God, we have everything. Live in it. Live through it. I understand, I want you to be blessed by God because God wants to bless you. If you're in Christ today, if you're a follower, you need to rejoice in that blessing. I know some of you don't feel like you're being blessed. It's a rough time. Unemployment, problems, you know, just a world gone mad. And so you're thinking, Pastor, I'm not blessed. I think if you look for it, you'll find it. I think if you look at your life honestly and take a deep breath, you'll find the blessing of God all around you. You'll find the blessing of God when you look at the sunrise and sunset. You'll find the blessing of God in everything you do. I want you to know, living on this earth as a follower of Christ, this is as close to hell as we'll ever come. But a reminder, those outside the faith, this is as close to heaven as they'll ever come. So when I share the good news of Jesus, it's not because of me that I get to eternity. It's because of him. I want you to be blessed. I want you to consider the blessings of God around you. And today, if you're on the fence about this whole thing, I encourage you to step across the line and be in Christ. You don't have to get your life right to be in Christ. You don't have to make changes. You don't have to do anything. He does it all through you. Remember, it is him living through you. And so I want to pray a blessing over you today. And I want you to hear that God is good. And he's already blessed you. If you're in Christ, open your eyes and see it. Wherever you are, would you just stand with me so I can pray over you? Father God, I pray for all those listening today, all those who are in Christ, that they'll understand the blessing that you've already given them. God, that you've already made them holy. God, you've already brought them into your family. You've adopted them. They belong to you. God, help them to live in that way. And God, I pray for those that are not in Christ, that they'll understand today that it is a beautiful life. And all we have to do is step across that line and say, Father, forgive me and come into my life and be my Savior. And at that moment, he begins to live through us. He gives us that deposit. He seals us for eternity. And we belong to him forever and ever and ever. And God, his favor is upon us. God, help us to see your favor. In Jesus' name. We're going to sing this song together. And my prayer continues for you that his favor will be with you. That his favor will be before you, behind you, and beside you. And you will truly live your life blessed.
your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you within you he is with with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, in your going, in your weeping, and rejoicing. you to come back next week. Bring somebody with you. Come serve with us on Saturday morning. Come celebrate baptisms. If you need to be baptized, uh, take that next step today. We want to walk with you. Come see us in the hub. If uh, we can help you in any way, take your next step in your faith walk. Uh, we want to say, um, may the Dallas Cowboys be blessed, or whoever your favorite football team is, be blessed today. Hope to see you next week for week three of I Am.